Hello, and welcome to our unit on pricing. Today, you uh, for this unit, you're supposed to be reading um, HERD uh, Chapter 11, Sources and Methods of uh, Financing. And this lecture is heavily uh, based on that chapter. To give credit. So what is pricing? Well, it's not very well understood. Um, you know, the least understood of the marketing mix, you know, the four Ps. Price is far more complex than simply assigning a dollar amount to a product or service. It's a total value assigned to a product. Notice that that means value. That's not cost. <laughs> so recreation and leisure products and services have monetary, opportunity, effort, and psychological costs to uh, customers and participants. And these costs are what make up the total value of the products and influence the marketing mix. So we have a monetary cost. And in this, I'm going to use an example of attending a hockey game. So monetary costs then are typical costs associated with a product or service. And they can include direct and indirect costs. So um, direct monetary costs for attending the game would be, you know, purchasing the game ticket, um, parking fees you have to pay, to, uh, purchasing a t-shirt to show lo loyalty, going to the concession stand, whereas the indirect monetary costs are things that you are getting, you know, it's still going to cost you. For example, gas, getting to the game, um, babysitter for children to be able to go to the game. And all of these things really require an exchange of actual money, the monetary costs. Then there are opportunity costs. This is about like what has been given up by the customer to participate or attend you know, this event. So like giving up other opportunities, they're giving up work or studying or maybe missing a different event. Maybe uh, missing um, a child's school play, for example, or, um, you know, giving up on something else that is important. Then there are energy or sorry, pardon me, effort costs. These are um, physical energy expended like the logistics of participation and the commitment of time and resources to participate. You know, all the effort that actually goes into participating. So, for example, effort for um, a hockey game might be high if the game is sold out and tickets are difficult to get. Or if personal schedules need to be arranged or it is hard to find someone to attend the game with or to get a babysitter. In terms of commitment, attending a game requires a large time and resource commitment. You know, um, if you're like a season ticket holder, considerable time and money are given to the team in comparison to attending just one game. And there's also psychological costs. So this is any emotional or cognitive change as a result of participation. And that can be positive and negative. So how much fun will the game be if you're going to this hockey game? The uncertainty of whether your team is going to win or lose. Um, or what if they lose by a wide margin? For a sports league or fitness program, another psychological cost might be that people experience low self-esteem or feel they lack skill needed to participate in these activities. So these four elements then make pricing quite complex. Before a fan will commit to buying a ticket and going to the game, they need to think about whether the game experience will outweigh all of the costs. And this is where effective marketing comes in. Effective marketing has a potential, uh, helps a potential customer to see the value of the product 
eases participation through things such as distribution, and communicates how um, the product meets the needs of the customer, therefore helping the customer decide to make the purchase. And knowing the costs then associated with a product and service and realizing how few of them are really money related is important to understand. There are, of course, lots of reasons to price programs uh, and services. You know, why do we have to care about pricing? Pricing may recover the cost of offering programs and services. So meaning it's, uh, you know, break even. But there could be programs that generate additional resources that could be used to fund other programs or simply serve as the profit margin for commercial agencies. So if you remember in um, the you know, private sector, people are obviously charging, always charging uh, enough money to make profit. But this might not be the case in um, the you know, public arena as we'll see in um, the case study we'll be going through. Prices establish really a value based on the price. You know, there's a price quality relationship. Pricing can also influence behavior through damage deposits on rental facilities, late fees for rental equipment returns, or early bird registration opportunities that give um, discounts. So like discounts for contracts or, you know, purchasing things or um, signing up very much in advance. Prices also promote efficiency and can shift demand from peak times to off peak hours. So, uh, you know, when you have a, uh, you know, every type of industry has, you know, seasonality with it. I'm thinking of hotels. So there's peak uh, tourism times when hotels are going to be more popular and you know the hotel industry gives um, rooms they usually allow rooms to be less expensive uh, when it's non-peak times or for example in a fitness center the peak times are going to usually be um, you know after work hours or in the morning so you might offer um, a membership discount to people and say well you know, give you a, a lower, it's going to cost you less, a lower price, but you um, are only allowed to use the facility during our non-peak times. For example, you're only maybe allowed to come between, I don't know, one and four in the afternoon. Other aspects of pricing that we have to consider is the psychology of pricing and also changing prices. Psychological aspects of price move beyond the economics of setting a price and cost recovery. The psychology of pricing really focuses on how people respond to set prices. And, you know, for example, uh, when I was in social psychology classes in graduate school, there were other people in those classes from business and a lot of it had to do with, you know, how would people, how do people respond psychologically to different, you know, marketing, the marketing mix. There's definitely a price quality relationship, or it's at least perceived psychologically. Consumers establish a price quality relationship where they perceive a, a price as equal to the value. So, you know, we... Um, Maybe not everyone, but a lot of people, for example, you buy a pair of shoes. Um, the, you know, looking at the $10 shoes versus the $80 shoes, I'm going to assume that the $80 shoes are a better quality. Whether that's true or not, it might not be. Um, but that is the psychology of it. So people really perceive more expensive products or services to be better. And you also, it's not just about tricking people, but it's also, for example, if you offer the cheapest, um, you know, price in town, you might not get, um, 
it might not attract all types of clientele because perhaps they're then viewing it that uh, your um, product and service is not as good quality as other places in town that have higher prices. There's also odd even pricing. This is a, uh, a pricing approach where you have larger value or perceived uh, as more attractive um, than if they were uh, rounded up, you know, the, these uh, decimal places, which I really bothers me. But, you know, the point here is that people, when you see 1995, they like to do $19.95 because your brain rounds that um you know, rounds it down to be 19, rather than often rounding up to be 20. You forget the the part there. And I know, for example, my father always laughs, my mother does this a lot. You know, something might be um, $999, and she will tell you that it cost 900, rather than saying it's $1,000. <laughs> um, and, you know, in that case, that's a $100 difference. But um, even when price difference is uh, minute, people will still perceive a greater difference than what it actually it is. And this results in greater revenue. This is why, you know, uh, people, a lot of for-profit places uh, price things with these, you know, decimal places. You see that at Walmart, Tim Hortons, uh, everywhere is, you know, has the decimal places. And again, that's a psychological trick with pricing. There can also be uh, changing prices. So when, um, how you change your prices is also psychological. People experience um, different things regarding the pricing of products and services. So there's reference pricing, objective pricing and subjective pricing. Reference pricing is when you assign a, pr a price based on what one thinks it should cost. You know, for example, you know, what do I think um, that a, a book should cost? I, you know, am I going to say, well, it should be, uh, you know, for a fiction book, um, paperback, you know, maybe $25. Objective pricing is, you know, the actual uh, price it is, you know, the what is actually being um, charged. You'll we'll understand that in just a moment. And subjective pricing is whether the actual price is perceived as being cheap or expensive. So just because, um, you, you know, the, and that really has to do with the history of the individual and their experience with your product or service. So if the objective price is much lower than the reference price, the item is perceived as inexpensive. So meaning that if the price that you um, think it should cost is um, ends up being, uh, you know, is less than, you know, the reference, you'll perceive it not to cost as much. Where the reverse is also true. Um, if the objective price is much higher, then the item is going to be perceived as expensive. So organizations want to set prices so that the reference price and the objective price are close to the same. Prices also change throughout the product or program life cycle. So this is, you know, whether... Um, something is in the introduction um, or, you know, growth stage, maturation, uh, saturation, or then decline. And adjustments are made. Quite often, it's more likely to in increase the price. But um, it depends. For example, in technology world sector, when a new product, product comes on the market, it is the most expensive. And um, it, supply and demand. And as uh, the, you know, as time goes on, you know, your iPhone, the iPhone 7 becomes less and less expensive with time. But often with um, especially services, this might be the opposite. You often are increasing your price as the demand goes up and then you might reduce it though, you know, as demand goes down. 
There's also a tolerance zone to price changes. People establish a tolerance zone where there's a slight increase in price as uh, to not impact purchasing patterns. So when the price change is outside your tolerance zone, it will be judged as expensive. Um, so for uh, example, you know, if you're charging a three dollars and fifty cents for admission to a pool, you know, for um, let's say open swim time, and you raise that to be uh, five dollars and thirty three cents, uh, that's you know that's a quite a large increase percentage wise. So that would be above people's tolerance zone for price increasing, and that's why. Um, pricing increases are always done gradually. You know, it's very slowly, gradually done. So, you know, it goes from 350 to 375. Then maybe uh, six months later, it goes up a little bit more. It's just gradually increasing the price uh, so that people will feel comfortable with that. And of course, the other trick that people do now is with um, products, especially with groceries. I don't know if you've noticed this, but they uh, don't actually change the price, but they change the uh, packaging, how much you are getting. So for example, I might be, um, you know, I might be paying $10 for a pound of coffee. Well, the next time I go, it's still $10. But when I really look, they have reduced the amount of coffee. It is no longer a pound. And if you pay attention, if uh, it's actually you can um, Google this and see, like for example, cereal boxes how they've changed and been reduced. The price, you know, per value maybe didn't change, but they're they're making it so that the cereal uh, you're still paying the same price for the box, but the box is smaller. So increasing prices um, is a difficult decision to make. It's tricky to know if increased revenue will offset customers uh, lost due to price increases. You know, you are going to lose some people because you're increasing prices. However, careful marketing can reduce the number of lost customers and enable people to more easily adjust their tolerance zone. So there's strategies that can aid in the acceptance of, of price changing. And one is explaining the details and benefits of programs and reasons for the change. Um, for uh, example, um, my husband was uh, involved with a, um, a farm co-op where you purchase, uh, you know, he worked there. And so, you know, you get your... Um, your bag, you know, your box of vegetables from the farmer uh, weekly during the season, and, and you pay ahead of time. Um, the next year, they increased their prices for the boxes, but they explained why. For example, um, they showed that the previous year, they as individuals only made um, around $3 an hour for the amount of work that they put into it. Uh, and, you know, explained why they were increasing it, what the value would still be. And, you know, people did accept that because um, you're explaining why you're increasing the price. Or, for example, you know, I remember in stores in Newfoundland when um, electricity and gas prices went up, you know, people, some, I saw signs that said, apologies, but we've had to increase our prices due um, to offset operating costs with, uh, you know, increased uh, oil and, and gas prices or whatever. You can also um, compare price to others um, to highlight the advantages of the program. So, you know, com you compare your price to others like it. For example, with an after-school program, I might compare um, my after-school program to those offered by the YMCA or a private sport complex in town, or like camping. You can also expand the program benefits and explain what changes were made to the program. You know, you really want to emphasize the price quality of re relationship. If the price goes up, people want to know what added value they're getting from these increased fees. You know, more instructors, better lighting, more cleaning staff. You know, what is it? 
So, uh, you know, you might have better qual quality trained staff. You might, um, you know, if you're doing an after school program, it could be that you're providing better snacks or you're doing a field, a field trip now, um, you know, and, and explain this. So those are really then um, a lot of the uh, psychological aspects of pricing, which are obviously really related to how we perceive changes to pricing. Next, we'll speak about pricing strategies. So these are strategies of pricing to meet financial objectives. Uh, and they are obviously, they're very related to marketing as well. So there are three strategies that we will talk about. Penetrating pricing, neutral pricing, and skim pricing. This was a, a developed by Ron, Dr. Ron McCarville. He was one of my profs at uh, undergrad profs when I was at the University of uh, Waterloo. And uh, he's a pricing specialist, but specifically focused on uh, recreation and leisure and sport. So penetrating penetration pricing is when you set prices really low to attract customers. It is when the purpose is to attract new customers and competitors' customers and retain them. So you're penetrating the market with this. This is often used in the public sector where agencies can use tax dollars to subsidize programs. So often, you know, um, especially in public recreation, we want to provide um, services to the community, to low income people as well. You know, so it's also about being able to offer some things to be really low uh, for the greater good of society, really. There are limitations though with penetration pricing. It can start pricing wars, which don't necessarily increase revenue. Um, and pricing wars are not good for customers and they're not good for businesses as they boost sales on a particular item, but do not necessarily increase market share or revenue. So, and it can be difficult for nonprofit and commercial sector to compete with public sector who subsidize low prices with taxes. But again, there's different things, you know, about recreation and leisure and sport in public not-for-profit or um, private sector. You know, there's sort of different value that you might perceive. Neutral pricing is when you set prices, they're not exceptionally low or exceptionally high. It is neutral. You set um, prices to be high enough so that revenue still pays for the costs. So this is really a middle of the road strategy um, it reduces the importance of price in the product selection and relies on other things such as quality and customer service to attract customers. Next is skim pricing. So skim pricing is uh, when you set a price based on what the market will bear, meaning that, you know, um, what is the, you know, what will the consumer market actually pay for something. And this is when you want revenue. The revenues are you know, greater uh, than the cost. You're wanting to make profit. The point is to generate revenue. So skim pricing is primarily used in the commercial sector because they need to make profit. The public and non-profit um, uh, can use this. You can um, use skim pricing to generate revenue from some popular programs like your cash cows in order to subsidize other programs. And um, an example are uh, at the works. I'm not sure what they uh, charge now, but they used to charge $2 for people to um, use the track, the walking track. That walking track, uh, it actually cost them way more than $2 for someone to use that track in terms of their operating, the staff, the lighting, the maintenance. But, um, you know, they, why can they do that? They're not, they're losing money, actually, with the letting people come in on the track. Well, 
they're generating revenue from other programs. For example, um, you know, probably like a private um, fitness uh, consulting and training, or for example, in aquatics, you know, they're not making money off the Ma and Tot program for swimming, but they are in like private lessons. Skin pricing can also be used, um, you know, to manage high demand. Higher price reduces demand to a more manageable level. You know, if you have so many people who are coming into your facility at a certain time, well, then, you know, you could, um, you can manage that by increasing the price, for example, at uh, certain peak times during the day or season, etc. cetera. Um, higher prices, you know, it reduces the demand. And an example would be like raising the price of a round of golf at an overused course, it may decrease the number of rounds played to a more manageable level. You know, maybe you have too many users for the facility for it to be sustainable. So, um, again, you need to, it's important to understand then the difference between these types of pricing strategies uh, and what their focus is. So next, we're really going to be talking about pricing strategies. Um, how do you actually set price when you, like in uh, recreation and leisure? And the cost recovery requires an understanding of how to price a, a program. And there's really a three-step process. You first have to determine the pricing variables. You need to determine your costs. And then you need to determine the subsidy rate. And I would say four two is also to determine the total price. So if you haven't done so already, um, if you uh, go on our course site, you'll see um, I've provided a case study there on a tennis clinic. And there is the case study as I would present it to you um, if it you know, was an assignment. And then there's also the answers. So we're going to be going through that case as I explain how you, the, the steps for actual you know, pricing a program. So the pricing variables are demand, contingency costs, fixed and variable costs, and direct and indirect costs. These are all the costs that go into an organization. So demand. Demand is how many people are actually going to attend your program or event. Some programs may have a minimum, like a below cancel program, and a max when they stop registering enrollment figures. Uh, often this is um, set on, you know, based on break even cost. You want to have enough people attend your program so you can, you know, break even. As an example, um, you know, obviously sometimes this isn't just about cost, but for example, at the university, uh, we have a policy that an undergraduate program, the minimum number that can be enrolled is six. And that's because it would not be cost effective to have an undergraduate class with an instructor and all the operating costs going into the classroom and the university. Um, if there were fewer than that, there just wouldn't be enough tuition money going into to the cost. Whereas, you know, um, for example, uh, a lot of class registration might, is maybe just based on, you know, what's the max that the professor can handle or how many seats are in the classroom. You know, for example, HKR 2000, um, you know, it is uh, 130 students are allowed in the course because there's 130 seats in um, PE uh, uh, 2001. You also have to consider contingency costs. So this is kind of like insurance in a way that you pay yourself though. So it's included in order to cover unexpected costs. 
Um, you have to include contingency costs as an organization because otherwise you won't have the money if something goes wrong, like you have broken equipment or your the roof needs fixing, that sort of thing. And this can be based on a per person basis, like a dollar per registrant, or it can be added to the cost of the program on a percentage basis, or both. You could have contingency costs for your uh, for operating expenses, and you can have contingency costs for the program. Then there's fixed costs. So fixed costs remain steady regardless of how many people um, are how many participants you have or how many people use your organization. And there's also changing fixed costs. So these are costs that increase, but not proportionally to the volume. For example, um, for a inst uh, instructor student ratio, if you have one instructor for every 10 students, the wage of the instructor is fixed, but the change in the fixed cost occurs after the 11th person. Because as soon as you have 11 participants, you need two instructors. Other fixed costs would be like facility rental, field maintenance, you know, things that it doesn't matter if you have one person or 120, you still have to pay that. The rent for the building, um, the, uh, you know, all these sorts of things. Then there's a variable cost. So these are costs that change in proportion to the volume. So each person registering for the pro program will increase the cost of expenditures. For example, supplies. You know, if I'm purchasing, we learned about all of this uh, in HCARE 2100, um, but we need to know, like, uh, for example, if I was running a soccer clinic, my variable costs are going to be team t-shirts, soccer balls, the booklet of drills and exercises for each participant. Um, if I have five um, participants, I'm going to need five t-shirts. If I have 33 participants, I'm going to need 33 t-shirts. So it's variable. Then there are direct costs. So this is the cost of the actual operation of a program. These can be fixed or variable. Um, and I'm going to use the example of a tennis program that we're going to be looking at. Uh, a direct cost is tennis balls. I cannot run the program without tennis balls. If I'm, you know, it doesn't matter. It's not a facility cost, it's a program cost. I also have direct fixed costs. So, for example, the tennis professional salary. It doesn't matter how many people are in my program, um, you know, I've, I, I have to pay for that. And then you have direct variable costs. So, you know, the, for example, like t-shirts. Depends on the number of participants. So indirect costs are really your overhead. So that's the cost indirectly attributable, attributable to your program. And these could be fixed or variable. Indirect costs then are things that happen regardless of whether your program runs or not. You might have, for example, the salary and benefits of the supervisor of, uh, of the program, you know, the, the leader, the supervisor who oversees the, you know, the, the tennis pro. There's some salary and benefits will be attributed to all the tennis programs. Or think of, um, you know, the uh, university setting. Um, there might be the instructor cost, but for example, the dean's salary is an indirect cost. Um, she's not actually, you know, maybe teaching the programs, but her salary has to be covered, you know, somehow through tuition or however, uh, you know, other financial means of running the university. So. An indirect fixed cost would be, you might say that um, your program is going to cover 5% of the salary of, you know, that supervisor. You could also include it as an indirect variable cost, though. You could say, well, for um, every single, you know, program and fee I charge, I'm going to 
add on one dollar, and that one dollar is going to cover the supervisor's salary. You also have to understand like organizational marketing costs. For example, at the you know uh, city recreation, um, each program is not advertised. You know, um, if you're running an aquatics program, you're not necessarily you're not advertising yourself. There's no program. Um, there's no budget component for the marketing. However, the city of St. John's markets, they put out their annual or not annual, um, their seasonal, you know, brochures and websites and all that. Well, that has to be covered somehow. And that is covered then through um, fees from indirect costs. There are a lot of decisions actually when you're running an organization for which programs you um, you're, and how you're going to allocate indirect costs. There are three ways of deciding, equal share, percentage of budget, and time budget of the study. So in my example, let's assume that um, we're looking at a sports club that um, has a general manager who oversees the supervisors in each of the four program areas. They've got tennis, golf, fitness, and bowling. And so that means we have, um, in this case, the, uh, the general uh, manager has a salary of $100,000. Okay, that's what they get each year. But uh, we then have to, you know, they're supervising all of these sort of uh, different areas. So if we were looking at this as equal share, the indirect costs were going to be equally split up among all the departments. And this is really used when you have departments are similar in size and the ability to generate revenue. So in this example, we're assuming that each tennis, golf, fitness, and bowling are similar in size. They have fairly equal ability to generate re revenue. So each of the four areas would assume 25% of the salary into their budgets. Tennis would get, you know, cover 25,000. Uh, golf, 25,000, etc. But another way that we could cover the indirect costs of the general manager's salary would be from percentage of a budget. So each program or unit is assigned a percentage based on their share of the overall budget. So units um, that are exceptionally unequal in size, cost, or ability to generate revenue, often this is how it is done. So uh, for example, in this uh, example, we're saying that tennis takes up um, 40% of the entire sports center's budget. Golf is 25, fitness is 30% of the budget, and bowling is only five. So that would mean that for the $100,000 salary, it's going to be spread across that based on the percentage. That means tennis is gonna cover 40,000 of the salary, golf 25,000, fitness 30,000, and bowling only $5,000 of the general manager's salary. And last is time budget study. So in this case, you are allocating indirect costs based on time. The time spent on tasks is measured and then assigned to that unit. And what this means is that it's assuming that some units might require more attention than others. You know, there might be um, more work to be done in certain areas, or more, it's more time consuming. So this is really a very accurate method, but it can take time and money to conduct an accurate study. And also it can change over time. You know, maybe you really have to pay attention to bowling right now, because the, um, you know, it's not going very well, but maybe the next year that's different and you spend less time. But in this case, let's say they've done a time study on how much time the general manager actually spends in these four areas. So they're spending 10% of their time with tennis, 
25 in golf, 45 in fitness, and 20% in bowling. Therefore, you can see the $100,000 salary is shared amongst that based on those percentages. So here's the, you know, comparison. And sometimes uh, what people will actually do is look at all of these things to decide which one. They look at the equal share percentage of budget and time budget, and that might, you know, help someone. Um, for example, look at golf here. It's saying that no matter which way we go, equal share percentage or time is 25000 so that's a pretty valid reason for why you should be allocating 25% of the general manager's salary to golf. So here is our tennis center. Um, this is presented in that chapter. And here we can see we have the different fixed and variable costs. The fixed costs include a loan payment. You know, obviously the tennis center took out a loan to maybe to purchase the um, facility or something. And it costs, uh, you know, it's $3,500 um, each month for 12 months. You also have facility maintenance. So, um, you know, to clean and uh, maintain the facility. So $1,700 over 12 months, you get your total there. We also have a head tennis professional and, um, you know, the pro. In this case, they're on salary. They're getting $50,000. So it's fixed. Um, it's, you know, uh, $50,000 over the year, so $50,000. Then there's administrative overhead. And this is usually often a percentage that's uh, provided. But in this case, this facility has decided, you know, it generally it costs um, the tennis center then $1,200 a month for different, you know, over, like administration, all the paperwork and, you know, maybe uh, secretarial time. So those are all of our, the total fixed costs. Where the variable costs are utilities. So, uh, for example, the, um, you know, how much uh, water and electricity is used, for example, is going to depend on use and also perhaps on the um, number of, you know, people that you have. So here they're saying it's um, uh, that they're open, the facility is open 16 hours per day, which is 300 and um, 350 days of the year. So when we're looking at hours then, that means it's 5,600 hours. It costs the center fifteen dollars um, an hour to, let's say, for lighting, water, and heat, and all that for the facility. So, if that's how much it is, then they're charging. That's how much they're uh, for how many hours, and that's how they get it's you know the total. They also have front desk staff that they have to pay an hourly rate. Um, in this example, they're being paid seven dollars an hour. So custodial staff as well. So those are then all of the variable costs. And so what we need to do now is determine what are the total fixed and total variable costs in order to run the center. So that is just some math. So to get the total fixed costs, I'm just adding up the loan payment, facility maintenance, head professional, and administrative overhead to get uh, a total fixed cost of one thousand, of sorry, one hundred and twenty-six thousand eight hundred. Again, to get total variable costs, I'm adding up the utilities, the front desk staff, and the custodial staff. So, and I get um, one hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars. And obviously, to get our total costs, total fixed and variable, you add those up to get a uh, two hundred and ninety. Uh, 4,800. Next, we have to determine the cost of one unit of production. So one unit of production could be the cost per person, cost per park, cost per pool. 
Um, so it really depends on the setting, but you'll understand a little better with our tennis example. There are um, formulas to determine this. We have to know what P is price. Obviously, that's what we're trying to figure out. F is fixed costs. V, variable costs. C is contingency costs. And N is demand. And there's two ways to calculate this, with contingency and without contingency costs. So first, we're going to determine the cost per hour of the tennis center, the operating costs. Um, we're going to look, you know, using the figures um, in their operating budget. We can then determine um, the cost of the program, you know, what would they need to generate in order to break even? You know, how much do they need to charge per, for the court time in uh, order to cover operating costs? So we're first going to calculate this with no contingency costs, no extra costs, you know, to save for a rainy day in case um, there's a leaky roof. So here we have, um, you know, P equals F plus V first divided by N for demand. So how did I get these numbers? Well, obviously the F is the fixed operating costs from table one. The 168,000 are the variable costs from table one. And 5,600 is the demand based on the 16 hours per day, 350 days per week is 5,600 hours a year. Add those numbers up, divide by 5,600, uh, and you get $52.64. So this is what the tennis center has to charge per hour for court time in order to break even with their operating costs, all of their, you know, indirect costs. Next, we want to add a contingency cost though. We don't, we're gonna be smart and we're gonna save for a rainy day in case uh, the roof uh, is raining. Um, so in this case, we're going to use a 5% contingency cost. So, you know, money that we're gonna save to repair facilities, cause you know, that happens. You have to put um, a lot of repair costs. You'll see that there's a little more uh, math involved here, but the numbers are exactly the same, so um, adding things up. And where did I get um, my 0 0.5 here? That's the 5%. So remember, you can't put we can't put 5 there. We need to put 0 0.05 to make it out of 100 by moving the decimal places over, um, you know, two spaces to the left. Now we've looked at the operating costs and what we need to, to um, charge court prices in order to break even for our indirect costs. Now we have to figure out how much our uh, actual program is gonna cost. In this case, we're looking at the youth clinic. How much are we going to charge for the uh, youth intermediate clinic? So these are the costs we would need to generate to cover all the program costs. So we have to look at the program budget. So, you know, you're then considering you know, what is in a typical budget, youth tennis clinic, there's gonna be potential costs. Some of these will be fixed. Some are going to be variable. So in this case, we have here the youth clinic unit cost. We have a demand, we have um, 30 children that are on six courts. So um, we can't, um, you know, the, sorry, 30 children is, you know, the max number that we, that we can handle, I guess. So we're gonna have some fixed costs. Tennis balls, we need one case. It doesn't matter, and, and we're talking case here, not a sleeve. Um, it doesn't matter if we have two or, you know, 130 participants, we have to have balls and, you know, we'll get, we're gonna have a whole case. Court time. 
as we've just established, it does not matter if we have one participant or 35. It costs us $55.28 every hour to maintain the tennis court, the, the one court. So here we've got uh, court time. It's going to happen two times a, a, a month. Then we have variable costs. So supplies, the supplies, uh, whatever the supplies are, uh, are going to be, you know, variable. And we also have uh, four instructors. So we can see our uh, total fixed costs are $170.56. And our total variable costs will be $125. So now we have our total cost two, adding those up, fixed and variable. And now we have to figure out then what we should charge per person in order to break even our program costs. So same formula as before, except instead of looking at your operating budget for the organization, you're just looking at the program budget. So we'll first um, are going to look at well, no contingency costs. And, oh, pardon me for the change in the screen there. Um, but in this case, how did I get these numbers? Well, 170 and fi uh, 56 cents are the total fixed costs on table two. 125 is the total variable cost of the program, again from table two. And finally, 30 I got from the demand. That's the number of participants that I can, I can have. So we end up then um, with the uh, $9.85. So this is what I need to charge each participant in order to just break even my program costs. But most likely we want to add a contingency cost. So that is 2D. What is it going to cost? We want to add a little bit still to our program maybe. If a contingency cost fee for an, uh, an unexpected program related occurrence, you know, it's going to increase a bit. Uh, and in this case, we're going to say that you know, maybe it's our um, facilities pol uh, financial policy, pricing policy to add $1 contingency cost just to every single, um, you know, registrant. So in this case, it's the same math as before, except we're going to add up then the $9.85 plus our $1 contingency cost to give us $10.85 is what I should be charging each participant at minimum to cover program costs. And, but remember, we're not, we haven't even considered operating yet as well. For purposes of the video, I'm going to end at, on this slide just so the uh, video is not too large. And um, you can, uh, we'll, I'll uh, finish the remainder of this uh, lecture in part two.